All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who are new here, just a quick rundown. Um, my name is Shelby Pritchard. I'm currently the IPM specialist here at SDSU, um, as well as the moderator for the Crop Hour webinar series this year. Um, and I appreciate all of you taking out time um, in your morning to be here with us today. A couple quick reminders, there will be a short poll after the talk, and I believe a short question in the middle of a presentation today. Uh, we ask that you please answer those, um, really appreciate that. And then also after the presentation, I will throw up a CCA credit for anyone who is looking for those. And also feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. We're happy to answer any of those for you. Um, and to jump right into it, we have one speaker today. It's David Karkey. Um, David joined SDSU Extension in 2014 and serves as an agronomy field specialist stationed at the Watertown Regional Extension Center. Um, before joining SDSU Extension, uh, David graduated with his master's and PhD from SDSU. And in his current role, David primarily focuses on delivering research-based information uh, to South Dakota producers and other stakeholders on topics related to managing crops and cover crops. And today, David's title uh, talk will be Oats, uh, Agronomy Basics and Nutrient Management. So take it away, David. Thank you, Shelby. When you said, you know, my grad school days, it kind of feels like I've been here for a long time. <laughs> okay, can you see my slide okay? Yep, we can see them. Okay. Uh, again, uh, good morning and thank you for being here this morning uh, to, to learn about oats or maybe, you know, make me learn something towards the end of the end of the presentation. Uh, so this week we had a pulse crop uh, and some forage information that we shared with you. And uh, today in the last day of the week is oats, you know, and I'll go through some of the basic agronomy and also second part of this uh, presentation would be more like a nutrient management uh, or nitrogen management and the study that we're uh, doing right now. So what you see here is, uh, uh, you know, NAS uh, data that came, uh, that I kind of pulled together from, uh, from annual report of small grains and I pulled out the numbers from oats. Um, and this is what it looks like is the blue uh, line that you see is the acres planted in the state from 2015 through, uh, through 2021. So that'd be about what, seven years. Uh, and the orange line is the harvested acres. Uh, and you may be wondering why it's low and where those other, other acres go. Um, that probably went more likely for forages because oats also uh, made a forage crop um, and, and makes a good forage compared to other small grains that we have. And uh, the percentages in the little red font and in the middle of the two lines that you see is the person harvested for grain. And, uh, and the picture looks really good in 2015, right? So you have, you know, 345,000 planted and 145, 45% of it is harvested. And, and then kind of goes a little down, um, you know, downward slope. So acre decreased a little, but back in, in 2020, it went back up to, um, you know, that 300,000 plus. And then, uh, and in the 2020, we're actually number one in the nation for producing um, oats grain. And 2021, as we all know, was a, a major, you know, um, drought and heat, um, kind of, you know, a lot of small grain suffered in the state. But this is just a general generality that I just wanted to give you a picture of uh, of the oat production in the state, and also along with South Dakota, you know, uh, oats grain, especially grain, are produced in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin. You know, historically, uh, but lately Iowa has produced uh, quite a bit of bushels also. Uh, so this is a little bit of a you know, where oats grow and where, you know, or where we get the, our oats from. So this is 2018 estimate is approximately 1.5 million tons of oats are imported in the U.S., which was, you know, 12% increase from the previous year or previous 2017 year. Uh, and in the same year, Canada was the main oats supplier for the U.S. 
accounting for up to 97% or almost all of the oats that we import is from Canada. And in 2019, the World Bank data shows that US is the biggest importer of oats in the world, followed by Germany, China, Netherlands, Mexico, and others. And there are you know, a bunch of other countries in the list too. So you know, approximate value for US imported oats is about 346 million you know, estimated in 2019. So biggest exported in the world is Canada. You know, Canada has made itself known for not only the oat producer country or oat producer region, it's actually the you know, uh, biggest exporter of the commodity. So that's, uh, and now I'm gonna jump into, uh, you know, agronomy of, of any crop, not only oats start from selecting a, a best variety out there. You know, we always have to give it a little bit of do homework and uh, to select a variety because that's your first point in, in, a, in best management practices for any crop, not only for oats. Um, so I found this bulletin, you know, that, that was published uh, by uh, South Dakota Ag Experiment Station back in 1914, more than 100 years ago. And it does say some varieties and strains of oats and their yield. So even then, uh, we thought, you know, doing a variety trial and comparing varieties which are out there on a side-by-side -side basis is a good way to inform uh, public about uh, the better lines that we have or better varieties uh, that can perform in our environment. Um, so here the, you know, it's hard to read those numbers in the table and I don't really expect you to, you know, look at, you know, every single number in there. Oh, uh, but, but the highest bushel back then was 40 bushel, the highest and 17 bushel, the lowest. And also you, you see that the one more thing that I want to point out is the bottom of the table says average of so many years. And uh, which is very important to average it out, you know, different locations and different years to actually know the best potential of that particular genetic or that particular um, variety. Now we fast forward to 2021, which is the latest, the last, you know, growing season we had, you know, 2021. And that variety trial or variety performance program still exists. And uh, you see a lot of names on the top of the slide from uh, Jonathan Kleinge and all the way down to Nicholas Hall. Uh, they're all involved in performing or, or putting out these trials across the state. These little stars you see on the, on the map of South Dakota are the, are the trial sites that these lines were planted and, and harvested. And then those numbers actually come to our extension website like this on the table on the right so that we can all look at it and then and make our decision uh, on which variety to grow in that particular region that you have your farm at. Um, so you have with fungicide also. So there's some you know, fungicide trial in other words. So you have height, you have lodging score, uh, you have test weight, which is very important again, um, you know, for, for food grade quality oats or, or grain quality in general. And, uh, and there's two year average of the same of the same variety and then also three-year average. So this is just an example, but I, there's a link on the bottom. Um, you know, you can go to that link and actually you can find uh, variety trials, results of variety trials in past few years from um, different uh, locations in the state for oats and other crops, other field crops also. Uh, so going back to, you know, um, when can we plant oats? Um, there is a, you know, saying out there is earlier the better, you know, beat the heat type type conversation, <laughs> which makes sense, you know, small grains like cooler weather uh, to grow that, you know, to put that, you know, enough vegetative growth uh, early in the season. Um, so theoretically, it's a textbook number. I don't want you to get hung up on this 35 Fahrenheit, you know, so germination temperature is 35 Fahrenheit, but, you know, above 40 is, 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 is always good. Uh, and a little warmer than 35 always, you know, speeds up the germination and emergence of the of crop. And uh, like I said, planting early provides that cooler climate for the maximum tiller, uh, vegetative growth, and also panicle. That's the head of the head of oats called panicle, uh, so that you can beat that July heat, especially in our environment, so that you know, and we get a good uh, 
good filling up those panicle and get higher yield and better quality seed. And optimum seeding dates, uh, you know, I like timeline rather than dates. Uh, so anywhere from, you know, moving from south, the southern part of the state going to northern, northern South Dakota would be, uh, you know, mid to late March to late April. Uh, I have had planted oats in May in the past and have done, you know, and that did okay. Uh, you know, we made that calendar, you know, it doesn't matter what we say, we can say whatever month we want, but it's actually, we're trying to name the weather pattern in the, in the state. So even if the May is, you know, cooler, cool enough and cooler than normal, it, it will do okay. You know, but, uh, but looking at historical uh, weather pattern, you know, uh, mid-March to mid-April uh, seems very, very logical for the, for our environment. And, and seeding rate, uh, which is another question that I get a lot, but you know, I, you know, but we don't have a real seeding rate study for oats and probably haven't had for a long time. And current rate is, you know, for any other small grains is 1.2 million uh, pure live seed uh, that you wanna harvest 28 plants per square foot at the harvest time. That's the, that's the ideal situation for any small grains, including oats, uh, that still holds true. Uh, and uh, you know the the weight, and and then I have you know, and then we also try to tend to say two and a half bushel, three bushel, two bushel type thing, but that's more like a you know depends on the seed size. And I did find a a bit old now, you know, 1998 data from the Carrington uh, Research and Extension Center, you know, of NDSU. Um, they did a trial with 1.25 million. Uh, uh, pure life seed was better yielding than the uh, lower rates of, you know, uh, 750,000 and 1 million pure life seed. So we still be around that 1.2 million uh, seed is still, um, still ideal, you know, for growing oats. Uh, however, now, um, uh, Dr. Melanie Cafe, uh, our old breeder at SDSU, um, her team did a organic trial and 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 for organic, of course, to to suppress the weed and um, you know we can't we restrict using all the synthetic you know products out there. So and, and there was a seeding rate trial done you know just two years ago, very recent one, um, and tried varieties named Saddle, Suma, and Rains, and rates were higher than so the the lowest rate was the 1.2 million. And then you know other three rates were higher than that. So one point all the way all the way up to two point three million. And and the result was uh, rate actually didn't show any significant effects on grain yield. Uh, but but two of the three varieties showed significantly better test weight and ground cover for higher seeding rates, which was expected. And then uh, and and the, the and I think the reason for better test weight is probably. Uh, you know, a lesser seed per plant, but the whatever seed that plant produced was the good quality seed. Uh, and now if you're doing organic or even in a conventional system, higher seeding rate, you know, tends to show that, you know, um, ground cover enough to suppress uh, weed and help you control weed in general. Uh, moving away from planting and seeding now, uh, I think I don't want to spend a lot of time in this, you know, we all have to control pests in our system, you know, weeds, diseases, insects, um, and uh, and for the weed control, uh, there are a lot of lot of products out there for broadleaves. But one thing to note is, if you're familiar with producing wheat and you think that you know lot, lot, all the herbicides labeled for wheat are also for oats, that's something to think about, which is not true. And another weed that kind of nuisance is wild oats. And and uh, that comes with the oats and, and don't have a selective herbicide just to kill all you know wild oats, um, but to manage that would be to root it out of oats, or plant a little late. But sometimes, given the given the depending on the uh, on the weather, um, you know, planting late may have some negative impact on grain yield. Um, and another um, the are the biggest. Uh, yield rack that comes in oats a lot of times, you know, yield, the plant performance, the uh, the test weight, everything, all of, you know, everything that that goes bad is something like rust, uh, crown rust, 
that's probably the most economically damaging pathogen, not only you know for disease world in pest as all, that's what I would consider as. And there are labeled fungicides. Uh, the timing is important, but uh, if you see some rust early in the season on the leaves, uh, which may not warrant you know applying applying the fungicide, but but when the flag leaf comes out, that's the time you want to uh, apply uh, fungicide for crown rust to protect that flag leaf, so that flag leaf can provide all the energy needed for uh, for panicle production and good seed production. Uh, at the reproductive stages of the of the crop, and another one is barley yellow dwarf that comes after crown rust, but I haven't seen a whole lot of you know barley yellow dwarf virus uh, having that much you know economical impact on on yield. Um, but that virus is vectored by cereal aphids, and uh, and there's once the disease is on the plant, which can be sometimes you know mistaken for nutrient deficiencies. But there is a certain way to identify, you know, the leaf that's that's uh, that has the virus. Uh, you can't really, you know, do much once the virus is in the plant. But you know, but we haven't really seen much that'll actually, you know, be economically damaging to go out and spray for aphids. And it's the bird cher cherry oat aphids is the culprit to to transfer those viruses. And, uh, and that virus actually gets, you know, the aphid can't get the virus itself until it feeds on the infected leaves of the plant. Uh, which is, you know, a lot of times is volunteer small grains that you have in the field and then grassy weeds that surrounds the field or in the field. And there's a there's a link which is very useful link um, that'll take you to uh, pest management guides. And if you have seen hard copies in the past, that's actually a white book that, you know, we update every year. So, so that link will take directly to the um, you know PDF version or the electronic version of the pest guides for, for all the crops that we have. So this is something new. So I'm going to probably spend a little more time on this one. Um, I don't know if you've heard about something called plant growth regulator or PGR. Sometimes you know you can you can see that in some documents. And Palisade is the is the brand name of the PGR, brand name of the plant growth regulator. So this uh, Palisade um, product came. You know it's 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 produced by Syngenta. And uh, came back in 2013, so it's fairly new product, and a lot of folks probably haven't tried it yet. And and some and I have I've seen some um, some folks who have tried in wheat, and it actually shortens the plant and makes the main stem a little thicker, hence you know uh, preventing lodging or helping helping with the lodging part of part of the part of the characteristic in the plant, and. Um, it makes sense to put on oats rather than other small grains because oats known for you know being more you know prone to lodging compared to other small grains. Uh, and large fields uh, are can lose a lot of you know yield. Uh, so on this picture that you see, right? Oh, I have highlighted a few things. So this is a snapshot of the label. It's not the whole label, of course. So the recommended rate is. 10 and a half ounce to 14.4 ounce. And it can be single application or more than one application, but can't exceed that 14 and a half or 14.4 ounce per acre rate. And you can apply anywhere from stage four, fixed growth stage four, which is, you know, when the tillers are formed and uh, tillers start looking a little stronger, uh, that's the fixed four. And then fix seven is that when you see the second node just coming out of the ground surface, that's your, so it's, a, it's, it's got a fairly wide window to apply this uh, growth regulator. And it can be applied in all the all small grains, you know, wheat, uh, barley, oats, uh, rye, triticale. Uh, you can try, you know, you, it can be applied in all others. Not, it's not only for, label only for oats. So since it's a new, fairly new product, and uh, I was able to team up with, uh, um, small grain, you know, scientists up in Minnesota, you know, University of Minnesota, he's out of uh, Crookston campus. Uh, in 2017 and 18, uh, there were a couple of trials in, in Minnesota and Morris and, and Crookston. And, and also we did one in 2017 in Garrison and 2018 in, in Southeast, SDSU Southeast Research Farm by Beresford. So 
So what we did was, um, so of course there's a control which didn't receive any PGR or the Palisade. Uh, and there are different rates and different times of the, of the year, different, different growth stages. The F, F5 is FIX5 and F5 and F7 is split application. When the crop is at FIX5 and then we went back and, and, and applied the same amount at FIX7. And then also single application on F6 uh, and also F7. Uh, if you remember in the previous slide, the, the maximum rate that you can go is 14.4, but you can see this 21 ounces, which is you know off label. So uh, we don't want you to do that. This is just for an experimental uh, purposes. So if you look at the data, the height, there's a bunch of height difference, okay? Later you apply, uh, shorter it gets, but you can't go to wait until the F7. Uh, if you wanna go F7, probably in your head, you probably wanna have F6 as a planned time because if the weather is warm, you know, in no time, it'll get to F7. And yield, uh, you can see the, the lowest yield is in blue color and then highest yields in, in, in red color, of course, on the, on the right column. So we didn't really see a trend uh, per se, but to shorten the height and then prevent that lodging, um, it looks like you know F6 is the best stage to go out and do and then apply at least 12 ounces of the product. Hope that makes sense. You know, after looking at all these numbers, I'm again telling my from my experience from one sentence is wait for that F6. You know, that's the first jointing stage uh, and single application uh, without mixing with anything else. If that you have that question in your mind, and uh, uh, and go about 12 ounces at least uh, per acre. So here's the uh, picture. I'm not a good picture taker, you can tell that, right? <laughs> uh, so on the top, you know, you have this dashed black line as the, the plot division, and then you see there's uh, two flags. It's a five foot wide plot because we had five, you know, we had a backpack sprayer, a five foot wide nozzle. Uh, so we went out and and, uh, and spray this part right here. And then this is a control. This is 21 ounces and, and on F7. So the difference was about foot and a half at this stage, you know, I would say milk stage. And the same, same plot looked like this at the time of harvest. When you apply too much later in the season, looks like, you know, a little delayed in terms of maturity because you see this green tint in this plot, but not at the other plots. So conclusion, uh, no lodging was noticed in either year, even for the control, we didn't see any lodging uh, because 17 and 18, um, you know, were fairly warm. Uh, I think must have been 18 that May was very, very warm. Uh, so recommended time, uh, again, uh, uh, so that's another thing. The recommended time is, you know, it's a timeline, not the date. Um, if you want to go, uh, so the planting, planting was, you know, mid March to mid April. Um, Fix five and six application were only a few days apart, um, and at one time there was a ten day gap between F six and F seven application. This is some of the things that we just have to um, troubleshoot as we go. Uh, it, it's all. It's very hard to hit right at the, the stage that we want because the you know because the weather, rain, um, and and things like that, or wind. Uh, so like I said, F six with um, you know twelve to fourteen ounce may be suitable for oats in our region. Um, when I say for oats, the reason I say that is uh, there are some instances where you know folks have gone at F five early in the season with lower application rate of 10 ounces or so, and then and then have good good result on wheat. But for some oats, because it's a little um, tricky and I don't know why it's tricky, it, it has to something to do with the crop's physiology itself. And, uh, and there are some growers that I worked with, you know, uh, or talked with, um, they have had, you know, um, I always tell producers, if you wanna try something new, try in a you know, smaller scale, and have a side-by-side -side check plots or check strips of some sort and, uh, and have reported success reducing height quite a bit, you know, uh, by applying at F6. 
So here's something about the oats or forages. Um, you know, we, we do grow oats for grain, uh, but also there's you know quite a bit more than half always get cut for, for forages for hay. Uh, so there is a there's a trial that you know um, Dr. Cafe, Melanie Cafe, our oat breeder did in 2019 and 2020. So so th these are also published on the extension website. Please go out and look at that. Uh, because we are a kind of moving or taking this um, finding varieties that can serve you both purposes, you know, yield if needed or forage if needed. Uh, so that's a dual purpose varieties where we're looking for that. So here's a quick uh, rundown in a lot of numbers there. So different locations has been tried for, uh, for the forages and there's some quality data, ADF, NDF, TDN and RV and then also the dry matter ton per acre um, in, those, in those cells. And then a lot of different varieties you see on the, on the very left column, these are the varieties tried. And this is done by STSU oats breeding program. And here's another one uh, that's uh, not by the, <laughs> not by the um, breeding program, but I collaborated with the producer last year actually, uh, and try different things. Um, you know, that producer, you know, when we do um, farm-based on-farm trials, we always wanted to have a producer's interest also. So there are some varieties you can see, you know, there is barley only, and then varieties are Goliath, Hayden, uh, Minnesota Pearl, Rushmore and Warrior. And also there are plots, you see this um, on, the, on the right here is a letter designation and then you see some of the two letters in the same cell that means the the seeds are mixed uh, so that there will be enough tonnage and less disease pressure because you know one variety can be can act different to certain stresses than the other so maybe combining both will have a better overall quality and quantity but last year was a little not you know <laughs> crop growing wise it wasn't really good because of the heat and the dry june we had so these are the numbers you saw. M is Minnesota Pearl was the top dry matter producer. Uh, and then the uh, R is Rushmore and Minnesota Pearl mixed together is also good. Uh, so Rushmore and Hayden was also good dry matter because Hayden is a little taller variety and does really well on the yield, uh, yield um, grain yield also. So I, if somebody asked me what, as a dual purpose variety out there, that came out of SDS, you know, South Dakota Ag Experience Station, I would say Goliath. So you can look at those numbers, barley didn't do well. And, and out of this, you know, there are 20 different, 20 different treatments or the mixes of varieties and the mixes of varieties. And then out in the 10, top 10, we sent it to the lab. So here are the, here are the quality numbers. Again, Minnesota Pearl had the lowest ADF uh, and lowest NDF. So it looks good on quality aspect also. So this is something that that's just the one year data, two replications in this in this location. Uh, we'll probably continue again this year and and then work and then go from there. But if you have any question on this, you can always you know throw in the chat or the or or talk to me after the presentation too. So forage oats and study, you know, um, we haven't done it. So I I stole this slide from uh, Kansas, you know, um, uh, faculty, you know, the the team that Kansas State had. Uh, you know, Western Kansas actually. Um, so on the on the on the horizontal axis here, you have soil plus fertilizer N. That's the total available N in the soil, including including fertilizer and what it, the, what the soil had. And also forage yield kilogram per hectare kind of corresponds to you know uh, pound per acre um, because of its you know. Uh, and then so. So applied were zero, of course, the check. So this is probably the check because soil had about 20 pounds in, and then 10 pounds, 30, 50, and 70 pounds in per acre. Uh, and economic would be somewhere around, I would say somewhere in there, total about 70 pounds, total 70 pounds, not applied. And also as the seeding rate had no effect, you know, there's, you know, seeding rate was 48 pounds, 66 pounds and 80 pounds per acre uh, tried. And this is the average of two years data 
So seating rate didn't have a whole, you know, didn't have significant statistically significant effects on, on the yield, forage yield. So I'm going to switch gear now. Oats in rotation. Uh, fits, you know, well after soybean, uh, but some folks have done, you know, following corn, as there's no concern of head blight like in wheat and uh, corn and or soybean that follows oats or other small grain have shown yield increase. And uh, we've seen that. Uh, and also provides good opportunity to adapt cover crops if you're thinking about oats and, and having cover crops, if you know, uh, so that's especially for livestock uh, incorporated producers, um, you know, cut oat for hay and then, you know, or, or oatage and then follow cover crops and graze um, in winter grazing. And uh, now with the soil health and cover crops world, this word you probably have heard quite a bit, you know, uh, in this presentation, not, you know, different conference and presentations called AMF or Arbor Square Mark Mycorrhizal Fungi and oats and flax uh, among uh, the species, plant species that we know around the state. I think those two are the um, species that actually, you know, um, supports AMF growth, which is good. Uh, for extracting nutrients and better efficient, you know, efficient extraction of nutrients for the cash crop. So AMF high present indicates good soil health uh, and beneficial association with plants. It's actually just acts like an extension of the roots so that it can, it, it can, it can bring in nutrients it needed from the soil uh, um, from, the deep, from the deeper profiles. And forms association with mostly all plants but some plants just favor better colonization in all plants, including weeds. Now I don't want you to go plant weeds, but that's what it means is all plants is some, you know, uh, is, is includes weed also. And depends on plants for sugar, uh, increased ability of oats for nutrient water uptake. I think I already said that. And when you, and sometimes in the corn on completely fallow ground, you know, we had that in 2019, we had a lot of fallow ground because of, you know, prevent plant and not, not having, you know, not could, couldn't get into you know planting in, in a uh, in a timely manner, and then the next year the corn might show early you know seedling corn or the you know early growth in corn it looked like pea deficiency, but it's believed to be the lack of AMF population in the soil because it didn't have any plant. It remained fallow the the whole year the previous year. Now uh, oats has cover crops. Um, so this is a uh, graph that you see from done by you know uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Lehman at the ARS unit in Brookings. And this is 2009 and 2010 data from Brookings, you know, their experimental site uh, and planted in August. And so even uh, spring wheat, sorry, a stubble. And then 2010, 2010 was in plant in oat stubble. Try different cover crops. You know, you have no cover crop, you have canola, you have oats, you have vetch, oats and canola, oats and vetch, canola and vetch, oats, canola and vetch. And here is on the, on the y axis, Dr. Lehman and his team was interested, they were interested in you know, measuring the AMF population in, in the soil. And, and you can see the, the, the bar pretty high where you have oats. And uh, it almost looks like a canola. Canola is not that much favoring to, to AMF population or colonization. Um, so that means you know, if you have cover crops with high canola or canola related species, brassicas, um, that may may or may not favor, I think lo looking at this graph, it may not favor the, the AMF growth. Uh, if you look at only oats as a cover crop, uh, you know, when you have oats, there's a lot of times volunteer oats that, you know, that's the seed that scripts your combine can grow as a cover crop. But there's, you know, we always tend to look at the above ground, but below ground can have significant differences too. This is just a food for thought that I want to throw. I wanted to throw it out there. I tried grew some oats in a in a tub in greenhouse and back in 2013 and looked at roots. So tried was gopher and horsepower. Horsepower was the newest variety back then, and uh, you had some you know um, root biomass differences in there. And oats has cover crop. Um, and uh, if you look at these numbers, you, you see bare 34. These are all the seed coatings. You know, they're bare means seed with no coating. 
uh, and 34 is 34 percent coating, 34 percent coating with absorbent, 50 percent coating, 50 percent coating with absorbent, 70 percent, 70 percent, and with it with absorbent, and two different location, and uh, these. These cover crops were hand sprayed in, 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 in small plots as a broadcast seeded, you know, when the corn started dropping leaves about first week of September, and that data was taken, you know, um, later, later that fall. And oat does have this adaptability. This, this, this number just shows that oat has a, this adaptability compared to other, other cover crop species that it can adapt and grow. Uh, even if you plant in the summertime, you know, you know, extreme heat, it probably don't grow, don't like it, but it still grows better than others. Um, and same in the Crooks location too. So this is the plot that we had that I took the data from that I showed just now is, um, you know, you have this oats plant growing in corn stubble, corn is already taken out. You see these flags, these are my plots. And uh, I was just showing oats, but you actually go out and, and remove, this, remove the residue to look at how many plants per plot were there. There wasn't already a rush green to get a biomass sample, but but you know, counting plants, um, there are, you know, you had to, I had to count plants. And also fall grazing. Uh, so this is a producer's field. Uh, these cows you see are in the ungrazed part of the field. So this is actually grazed. Uh, this was planted late July last year. And then um, I sampled you know, on September 24th and, and dried it out and then saw the dry matter ton per acre uh, about 2.3, and turns out, you know, the cows actually left, this is only a, a, a 44 heifers and, and, um, and stayed in this cell, this cell only for, for a day and moved to the different one, but there's quite a bit of dry matter still left, about 60% dry matter left, so these cows came back. Um, and then uh, and th this point forward, the producer decided to you know, keep the uh, keep the group for for two days rather than just one day. Move in every two days. So this is something we're also learning. Uh, we don't know how many cows needs to go and 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 on how many acres for how many days if you have this kind of particular mix. Um, but even in a dry year like last year, uh, there were quite a bit of quite a bit of um, dry matter produced. After oats that that was being hill that was being built that had that was built and also um, the, there was another field that actually harvested for grain and planted these cover crops afterwards after the grain was harvested and these cows actually went back to that field later in the season. So here's the uh, economic uh economic economics of oats you know and you probably know that by now that you know if prices are going up. So this is all the way from 1970 uh, and how the price has changed. It's every 10 day interval you have, 10 years interval, sorry. Uh, then, you know, 2020, after 2020, you know, it's going up. And on the right, you may disagree with the prices that I put for $45 for fertilizer because I know fertilizer price had gone up, but this was just a, without, without the inflation, you know, this is not any kind of scientific method that I use. I just sat down with a couple of producers and kind of interviewing, you know, questioning them and and putting down numbers. Okay. Um, so something that is a question mark is land rent. You know, we put two hundred, you know, dollars in there. It could be two twenty. It could be one eighty. Um, I don't know. Um, and you can look at the numbers. And if you produce one hundred twenty five bushel oats for this math that we did. $2.98 per bushel would be a break even point. Okay. We don't recommend, but there is also always a value of straw, also, you know. And uh, plant growth regulator, the palisade we talked about, it could cost you about 18 bucks thereabout. Um, uh, so this is something to think about. You know, it has, oat has been a, a, a profitable crop for the folks in the last few years. We had them in the rotation and also following with soybean and corn after, after oats have shown better yield also. So that's something to think about. So this is from Dr. Antonio Mallarino from Iowa State, uh, Iowa State University. You know, this is done back in uh, 2006. Uh, there are other graphs like this. I just wanted to give you a little hint. Of course, we know that corn does well after alfalfa. 
So Dr. Mal Malarino was um, measuring corn yield. Uh, there is a corn after corn after corn after corn. That means four years corn in a row, and then and then broken that four four years uh, sequence with alpha alpha or soybean or oats type thing, and then alpha alpha you know uh, underseeded with oats type thing. But in this graph, I just wanted to show you something. Uh, so highest corn was after after alpha alpha. This should be alpha alpha right here. But after that first year corn after oats was right in is right here. This particular so right here. Okay. So at 40, 80 pounds n per acre after oats the the corn re reached that maximum point right there. And when, when you have other, other, other sequences, even after putting 240 pounds of N, these lines can't go or reach over there or over here or over here. So what it shows is having oats or soybean or alpha alpha or breaking this corn after corn sequence is better. Um, you know, it could have been wheat. We don't know, but the experiment didn't have wheat, but did have uh, other, uh, other sequences. And this slide here is almost feels, you know, out of place sometimes, but I just wanted to show you the rotation effect of uh, on soybean yield. Uh, so if you think this particular line is a corn soybean rotation, that's 100%. And if you have continuous soybean on the Y and the, the X axis here, and you have this treatment number one, which had at least two years without soybean, when you don't have two years without soybean, that means it was, soybean was replaced by oats or wheat or some other crop, then the, then the soybean yield the following year goes all the way 106% of this particular reference point that we have. So breaking up rotation is good. And then oat can serve that purpose in our environment to break up and, and stretching out that, uh, diverse crop rotation. That's the take home message of this slide. Almost, you know, it's a, it's a review, you know, you re, it's, a, it's reviewed from 56 side years. So a lot of, you know, uh, dedication went in their slide. I thought I would, I, sh I should show that, show this. So next few, few minutes, we're going to talk about the nutrient management of oats. Uh, so this is the current recommendation we have. Um, and next few slides, we'll be talking about the nitrogen part. That's what I have the nitrogen on the, in the italics here. Um, so this is something, you know, you see in our uh, fertilizer recommendation guide, this table. So you will probably see a poll question quick here. Uh, if you can answer that quick, it will give me some idea of where you stand in terms of your nitrogen fertilizer on oats grown for grain. And the question does say, including legume credit, that means soybeans or alpha alpha, and also the soil test and including everything, how much, how much do we usually figure out um, and, you know, pounds of N per acre, that's the question. I'll give you a few moments. Okay, so this is the nitrogen equation that we have on this book where you actually see the table I showed you in the previous slide. Um, so that says 1.3 times the yield goal And by the way, the poll result came, you know, uh, what I was thinking, what I was expecting, which is good. So nobody's over applying or under applying. Uh, uh, it's it's a lot, lot of you answered as 50 to 100 pounds as your preferred rate, including your soil credit. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> legume credit and soil uh, soil test nitrogen. So, 
So this is the equation we have, and that book is 1.3 part three times yield goal minus the you know, soil test N and the legume credit. So that seemed a little high, um, you know. Uh, so we started this trial. The current fertilizer recommendation guide was published or updated in 2005. So the wood data could be even older than that. So current recommendation of 1.3 pounds of N for, to produce a bushel of grain is, uh, it seemed really high. You know, I have, I know the, a lot of oat growers uh, have, um, you know, successfully grown oats with much less nitrogen than the 1.3 uh, you know, multiplication factor we recommend. So we wanted to revisit the calibration. That's that's the, um, so we wanted to do a little research. And also when we were doing the nitrogen study, we wanted to add the plant growth regulator, you know, on the top of that, especially in two locations, Southeast Farm and Northeast Farm, where we can manage our, you know, growing season a little better. And uh, so I already talked to you about the growth stage for um, Palisade. Um, so it started out with only one location at the Northeast Farm in 2016 and 17, uh, and used 20, 40, 60, 100, and 140 pounds of N per acre. That's actually applied on the top of soybean credit and and the and the and the soil test N. And and for Palisade, both years, it, you know, we tank mix the Palisade with herbicide early in the season, about fix four, fix five, with bronate, and didn't show didn't show any effect of of high differences. Uh, the palace didn't do anything. Uh, and in both years, we have just significant yield response to N, but nothing to Palisade. Uh, there's no yield differences due to Palisade or there's no height or lodging differences due to Palisade. But in 2018, uh, we proposed this study to the Nutrient Research and Education Council in the state and they were able to fund us. So we expanded this trial uh, to different locations in the state uh, and also started doing the separate single application, uh, standalone, I shouldn't say single, standalone application of Palisade afterwards. So 2016 resulted in Northeast Farm. I know uh, Northeast Farm, you know, cooler climate always favors small grain, you know, yields. Historically, it has shown that and Palisade and no Palisade, you can see, um, but the nitrogen has quite a bit of effect. You know, you see this line curving on the top. Uh, so that's 2016, that's one location, Northeast Farm. So 2017, just Northeast Farm. 2017 was drier than 2016. So overall, less bushels, um, no differences uh, uh, due to Palisade. In 2018, we started doing the separate application, just with Palisade. So Northeast Farm again, um, Northeast Farm is by the way, 15 miles north of Watertown. So we used variety Hayden. You know, highest yield was observed for zero N, that means no palisade, uh, zero N means no nitrogen applied. Uh, you can see no nitrogen applied has one of the highest yields in the whole trial. But the soil had, you know, so 40 pounds uh, soybean credit and then soil had quite a bit N already in the soil so that, that the check plot or the zero plot was able to produce enough grain, you know, um, as compared to other other application rates, so almost if you if you look at the yield versus the amount applied amount n applied, so it's zero point six pounds or sixth of a pound of n per bushel of grain then average. So again, uh, Northeast Farm of two thousand eighteen, um, the palace had reduced the height up to six inches. Uh, you can see that in the graph. So twenty nineteen Northeast Research Farm again. Uh, nitrogen rate on the x-axis and then yield on, on the y-axis, you have, uh, you know, nitrogen rate. Again, zero means zero applied, but soil and, and legume credit uh, were there. So it says pre-trial N or the soil test N was about 80 pounds, you know, 40 in the soil, 40 for, uh, for the soybean credit. So 80 pounds was able to produce, you know, this much crane, Right about the 40 pounds applied in, you can see the graph kind of you know plateauing um, after about 40 pounds applied. But each year and each location is different. So 20, so 2018, 2019, 
2020 and 2021. Uh, we have had other producers feel also, but I'm just trying to give you a you know glimpse of what we're trying what we're trying to do or what we are doing and, and what our global goal is instead of showing each graph for each location you know in the, in in every slide. So 2020 we have Aurora, Chamberlain, and Garrison. Um, so Chamberlain was the highest yielding site that year in 2020. You know, followed by Garrison and and Aurora, and you can see. Uh, and in, in the farmer producers field, uh, we didn't have the palisade treatment, just the nitrogen treatment. Um, you're seeing, you know, even in the highest yielding site, Chamberlain about 40 pounds and kind of plateaus or goes down, which is variability a lot of times. So another thing, you know, we were thinking is, do we have any effect on the grain quality, you know, especially with nitrogen and palisade? Palisade is the one that I was really curious about. So we sent our subsamples from our plots to General Mills Lab to analyze for the grain quality parameters. And 2021 was not analyzed because it was dry and I lost you know, a few sites because those fields were uh, a bill for hay. Uh, two years data showed no negative effects of late applied palisade on oats grain quality. And these were the you know, parameters that we measured. And this is just a standard um, test that General Mills runs um, anywhere from NIR protein to how much oats or plump seed, you know, on the growth percent, thin percent. Um, beta glucan is another one that's that's um, that's interesting. We all you know look for that healthy oats uh, and the fat fat concentration, etc. So, so that's probably my last slide, but also a meat and potatoes of all the end data I showed. So you have about ninety data points in there. Uh, so this is so, different than my previous slides is this is total N applied plus soil test N plus the legume credit. So this is, I would consider total available N in an ideal world. Uh, but the check one, or the, or the zero or the check plots where we didn't apply anything on the top for the test, the soil already had about for anywhere from 23 to 96 pounds of N. Uh, that's probably the reason you don't see, well, you know, the, the typical end response curve that you all, we are all used to seeing on, on, on corn or wheat or any other, you know, where the, where the graph goes up, it responds to certain point and plateaus. This is more like a, there is no relationship at all. And, uh, and even the check ones, check ones are even the, even the points within this within this line are yielding as high as, you know, 140 plus, 120, 130, you know. So there is no certain relationship per se. And uh, if somebody asked me to draw a line, so this is handmade, a red line was handmade. It wasn't just, you know, came from any statistics. And, you know, you see this R square of 0.03, that means there is no relationship even with the polynomial line that I wanted to run through or the linear, if it was even lower. So right about that 90, 90 to 95 pounds of total N is probably where you wanna be at when we're trying to produce oats for grain. And a lot of my sites are, um, you know, or East River or, you know, on the, you know, some I-29 corridor and some, you know, 281, um, you know, we had Chamberlain, we had Highmore last year, but some of the environments that we tried and collected these 90 average data points, these are averages of the, of the three replications we had in each site. Um, so I would put this line right around here just, just for both agronomic performance and also economic performance too. Uh, so you don't wanna apply too much if you don't need it. So give or take, you know, if you haven't done soil test, give or take if your soil has about 20 pounds in and you had soybeans, so that's about 60 pounds, if you want to throw in another 30, 35 pounds of N, I think, I think we're, uh, I, you know, you'll be in the safe, safe side. So the conclusion here, the results obtained so far is anywhere from 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 pounds of N for push of corn, grain. Um, and another thing to keep in mind in any crop is more N or more resources is needed to produce 
the equal amount of grain in a stressful environment. So if you have a drought, if you have a flood, if you have, you know, high wind and heat and all that, you know, things that we have to face in a, in a crop production or egg production world, it will take more resources to grow equal amount of uh, uh, grain. And then if you, if you want to, you know, this is not a, any kind of, uh, in a certain recommendation, but PGR, plant growth regulator can be a useful tool for reducing lodging and oats, especially oats are prone to lodging. And uh, the 1.3, you know, uh, coefficient or multiplication factor that we have with yield goal um, is seems a little higher at this point. So 0.7 or the flat rate of 90 to 95 pounds seems, uh, seems economical uh, and environmentally friendly. Uh, you don't want to have the nitrogen going downstream either. Uh, so that's 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 where we stand. Um, but it's funded for 2022 also. So we'll do another year of this, um, repeat this experiment, and then get more data points to, uh, and then probably you know have a publication and update our, update the numbers in our book. And would like to thank South Dakota Nutrient Research and Education Council for funding the N calibration project. Uh, and here's my contact information. Um, I'm based out of Watertown office, Watertown Regional Extension Center. Uh, there's my email. My office phone number is 8821. Um, and then my cell phone number, um, you know, that has the four, last four digit of 3029. And, uh, and anything related with the boats, or last week I talked about, you know, cover crops, uh, basics and four forages. Um, and so those information that we usually talk or give during this presentation, we also published on the extension website, extension.ststate.edu. Uh, here's the civil rights statements. Uh, I think now, uh, I think I'm open to any questions. All right, and then I'll have you stop screen sharing, David, so I can pull up that CCA credit. And then looks it like looks there are like three questions there. Yep. So there's something uh, from from Scott about the some of the things that affect the commodity price of oats and and on what are the u.s current stocks i i don't know the current stocks of of oats in the u.s right now but i think it's most of the time supply demand how much is um it's always a supply of demand uh, you know how much is grown how much is needed uh, obviously we like to consume oats um for different you know especially for for food products breakfast products and then uh um, and the, and a lot of times, you know, the, the survey, uh, and, and also with the corn and soybean prices up, you know, how the, how the, uh, the production, you know, um, the number of acres that went to oats, um, uh, well, will be impacted by the, by the, you know, um, growing prices of other crops also. Those are some of the things I can think of right now. Um. Is there any benefit to applying Koran with weed spray or fungicide? Uh, is is Koran a uh, so? If you can, you know, uh, explain this question a little more. What the Koran uh, is? Is that is it a is it a uh, Growth regulator or or is some other product? Has oats been ever dormant seeded? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, in South Dakota, I haven't really you know seen oats dormant seeded, uh, but it could work. Uh, if you go out and you know, um, especially for forages, uh, you know, to stretch out the uh, you know the load in the farm operation can be you know dormant. But I haven't seen dormant seeded oats unless it's in the, some other cover crop mix that we want to do it. All right, and if there's 
no follow up to that middle question. Um, give them a little time. I'm sure if they need to, they can reach out to you, David. Yep, yep, absolutely. For that, for that question. Um, but we appreciate you talking today and we hope that everyone can join us next week um, when we begin to discuss climate, market and management considerations. So thank you again. Thank you, Shelby. And thank you everyone for attending this, uh, the presentation.